Welcome to this lecture entitled The Progressive Era and Middle Class Cultural Hegemony. Let's start out by defining cultural hegemony. Cultural hegemony is a mechanism by which one social group establishes and maintains power by securing the consent of subordinate groups rather than by suppressing those subordinate groups alone. The theorist who introduced this concept was Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci, pictured here, who lived from 1891 to 1937 and died in a fascist prison. He wrote that the superordinate group uses its cultural institutions and its ideology to maintain power. This group normalizes its own values, that is, it identifies its own values as common sense and other values as foolish, incorrect, or abnormal. Let's look a little more closely at how hegemony works. A class or a group, called by Gramsci an historic bloc, develops a shared consciousness and an identity. That group exerts power in society that it portrays as leadership, and it comes to dominate that society. The group expands and enforces its dominance against what Gramsci labeled the subaltern. The subaltern is a block or a historical group denied access to power. Sometimes this enforcement of dominance is through coercion, such as direct suppression or the use of police. Sometimes, more subtly, it occurs by delegitimizing alternatives proposed by the subaltern through public discourse. Mostly, though, it creates a powerful dynamic between itself and the subordinate bloc. The dominant bloc offers a compelling and attractive ethos or worldview. It communicates this ethos and worldview through proselytizing and cultural signifiers. Subalterns resist, but ultimately acquiesce. The subaltern block often challenges the dominant power, but often it's fractured, and eventually its individual members accommodate the hegemon or segregate themselves from it, even while challenging it. In your readings, Jackson Lears wrote that, quote, vestiges of the old culture survived in the new, unquote. We can see this in an example that I'll give you about Jim Crow South. In the Jim Crow South of the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era and later, racial segregation hardened, forcing African Americans to withdraw into their own communities. And white supremacy as an ideology became more pronounced and vocal than it had been in antebellum America. Even so, there were many examples of cordial, though paternal, personal relations between whites and blacks. This is a vestige of that antebellum culture. This concept goes toward answering the question of why, when racism seemed so virulent, did many white and black people appear to get along so well? Let me make an aside to say, in my own life, my grandfather, who died in 1969, was a virulent white supremacist. Yet his closest fishing buddy was a black fellow who lived not too far from where my grandfather and grandmother lived in Montgomery, Alabama. Nevertheless, my grandfather was very patronizing and paternal to this African-American man, but they were friends. African-American comic and activist Dick Gregory summed it up a few years ago when he said, quote, in the South, they don't care how close I get as long as I don't get too big. Now, he was contrasting that with how he felt about the North, where, quote, they don't care how big I get as long as I don't get too close, unquote. Now, hegemony is not just a top-down function. As the older hegemon weakens, a new one can emerge, and this is exactly what occurred in the progressive era. As capital on one side was battling against labor and farmers on the other, each side tried to establish its dominance in the political economy. But a middle class began to identify itself and coalesce, and it became conscious that it could establish its place 
as the dominant socioeconomic class in America. Let's look at the progressive era hegemon of the middle class. Again, the progressive era saw an emerging cultural hegemon, that is, this middle class attempt to remake American society in the image it had of itself. This is McGurr's entire thesis. The middle class addressed perplexing questions brought on by industrialization, and this is part of its ethos and worldview that was attractive to other sections of the culture. It asked and, and tried to answer, what is the place of the individual in a mass society? What places in society do the public and private spheres hold? What are the relative roles of men and women in society? What are the relative roles for economic, social, cultural, and political institutions in society? Now, we can't get very far until we begin to try to define this middle class. Defining the middle class, the middle class is elusive and it's hard to define. McGurr suggests that the middle class were white collar service workers who existed between the upper class on one hand and the farm labor block on the other hand. Using McGurr's ideas, let's look at the demographics of what we think were middle class service workers. As the graph shows here, in 1900, coming from the census, there were 5.1 million generally white collar workers. These were professionals, salaried managers, officers, proprietors, and sales and office clerks for the most part. This was 20% of the U.S. population in 1900 that was neither poor nor, nor wealthy, and they were concentrated in towns and cities so they could work together and begin to identify themselves as a group and then a class a little more easily than they could have if they had been scattered around in rural areas. In the 1910 census, we see these white-collar workers climb to 6.8 million people, and in the 1920 census, we see this climb to 9.3 million white-collar workers. So what were the values that the middle class began to see in itself and began to normalize across the face of the American culture? The first was limited individualism. That is, they had a sense of themselves and a sense of autonomy that was tempered by their identification with the nuclear rather than the extended family. The middle class tended to marry later, and they had smaller families than their predecessors and than the working class did. They valued individual space, and they valued individual attention because both space and attention were available to them. They had a sense of rights that they added to the old Victorian sense of somewhat puritanical duty. A change in housework, for example, and a change in child care reduced the female private sphere. Women, therefore, sought options for greater public presence. Activist women increased the strength of the middle class to enforce its hegemony by adding their organizations and their voices to those of their men. For their part, men sought access to less work and more partnership at home. This sense of rights extended to possessions as cultural signifiers. They also believed in solidity and respectability. The middle class tended to view both workers and the rich as frivolous and silly. That is, they normalized their own code of ethics above that of the workers and the rich. They believed in substance and privacy, quietness and gentility. And what they really sought was safety. They wanted to tame the industrial and the urban crises, discipline rampant individualism and mutualism that they thought of as socialism. And according to McGeer, quote, the Victorians sought to make individualistic rich people like George Pullman behave and to reshape workers' and farmers' lives, unquote. That's from page 67. One of the mechanisms they used to do this 
we call associationism, that is, cooperation in voluntary associations. This was manifest in the advent of professions like law, medicine, teaching, social work, and the spread of these professions throughout the knowledge economy. The American Bar Association began in 1878 with state bars in all lower 48 states by 1916. The American Medical Association formed again at the national level in 1901 to compel medical education and licensing. The NEA, the National Education Association, began to organize itself at the national level by 1905. There was the National Federation of Settlements that began in 1911 after a private corporation called Survey Associates, Inc., created a social work magazine called Survey in 1909. We can also see this in economic and social interest groups. For example, there had been plenty of chambers of commerce and boards of trade in cities in the Gilded Age and the early, early progressive era. But the national organization of the Chamber of Commerce was created in 1912 at the very height of the Progressive Era. We see the National Association of Manufacturers, NAM, developed in 1895, and it was virulently anti-union. We also see, and I've said this before, the General Federation of Women's Clubs begin organizing itself in 1890 and then formally organizing in 1895. So in summary, the middle class of the progressive era saw themselves as the disinterested public in the war being fought between capital and labor. Having gained consciousness of their own identity and emerging power, this middle class normalized its own value system and used its cultural power and later its political power to gain control over those parts of society it believed were a threat. This we call establishing hegemony, and we call this middle class the cultural hegemon. How successful was the middle class in this endeavor of gaining the acquiescence of the working and the upper classes to its idea of what constituted the good life? then let me ask you, do you know anyone who does not identify themselves as middle class, even when they are obviously working class or upper class? As you think about that, I'll tell you that this ends the lecture. And as always, thank you for your time.